Welcome to the Hawkcast with your host, AJ Hawk. Jen Briney joins us. So, Jen, you're a, a little bit of a change up for normal guests I, that I have on here. So, I don't even know where to begin with you. You, you host <laughs> Congressional Dish, which when people think of, of me and different people I have on here, I guess it's not the, the top of their list, thinking someone that reviews what Congress is doing and, and breaks down the legislation, and everything that's going on. But I, I've been listening to your shows, and it, it, it's super interesting to me, and I realize how little I really know about what the government does. Oh, thank you. Yeah, um, well, that's kind of why I started doing it, because I realized I didn't know what was going on. Like, I started it during the Obama years, and when I turned on the news, it was all about Obama, just like right now it's all about Trump. And I didn't know how they were changing the laws. And then I started watching C-SPAN. And once I started seeing what they were putting in the laws, that's when I was like, hey, there's something here that's not being talked about. And that's something I could do. So that's really how it started. It, were you always into the, the inner workings of the government or did this gradually happen over your life? No, this happened gradually. It was actually it wasn't all that gradual. It started really in 2003. Because I was studying, I was in college, you know, just drinking, being stupid. And I ended up studying abroad in Germany when we started the Iraq war. And so having watched that be launched from Europe, they took it much more seriously than we did. But I didn't realize until I came home the difference. Because over in Europe, like we would go to bars and they would have soccer on one TV and then they'd have British Parliament on the other one with the sound on Parliament, you know? And so that was what the conversation was about. And people would hear my accent and be like, why are you starting a war? I'd be like, I have absolutely no idea. Sorry. Um, so I just felt really stupid and didn't love that. And then when I came home and found out the way the war was it was almost like a TV show, like the shock and awe stuff. I saw it in a documentary, the stuff that you guys saw here at home, and it was disgusting to me. And that's when I kind of realized that there was something weird going on with our media, that we weren't being told the whole story. And um, and yeah, and I just developed this obsession, and every question that I had led to 15 more questions, and 15 years later, here I am. Well, the, each episode you put out is so in-depth, and then all the show notes you put as well – how long does it take you to do one? Say you have one two hour show. It seems like just massive amounts of work. Yeah, it takes me about two weeks. I figure I have like the first week of my process is kind of my research week, which is my favorite because that's when I get to go down the the rabbit holes and find all of this stuff. I mean, that's really fun for where, me. And but where do you find it? I don't. I don't even know how. Uh, it, it seems we're we're so ignorant. Uh, normal, I guess, just the casual American going about their business. I wouldn't even know where to go. Yeah. And that was the first two years of this. That's what I was trying to figure out. And so through this, I learned that there's something called the Daily Digest. It's like seven pages and it just tells you what bills passed and what hearings took place. And it's not just the hearings that are in C-SPAN. There's a lot more hearings than that. So once I found that, I kind of look through the Daily Digest, figure out what happened. And then the things that grab my attention that's what I'll look at. But I'm generally looking for the things that are not being talked about on TV or anywhere else. So do you affiliate with any party? No. No. In fact, I was raised Republican. And and when the Republicans started that war, that was the first time I questioned anything. In fact, I was 18 when I got to vote for the first time, and I voted for George W. Bush. So a lot of this does come from my own guilt from that that ignorance. I didn't take my own vote very seriously at all. And so I felt really guilty about that. And then really in the Obama years is when I realized that a lot of the same problems that the Republicans have, specifically like working for big companies and <laughs> dedication to being warmongers all over the world, the Democrats have a lot in common with them. So no, if anything, I'm mad at the two parties for different reasons, but I'm constantly mad at both of them. But you don't uh, take sides and say, I guess you're a libertarian? No, I don't label myself at all. That's good. That's the thing. I, I think in yeah. all in all facets of life, why do you, why do you have to? I, I've always been confused by that when it comes to politics. Why do you, there's no way that anybody say you consider yourself a Republican that you can agree with every single decision and every single opinion that the Republican Party has? I just can't imagine that. And what was stunning to me is I. I didn't realize that the Republican Party doesn't do the things they say they stand for with fiscal conservatism probably being the best example because they talk about being the ones that will balance budgets and they care about, you know, not spending too much. They're full of it, which this Congress is proving. They're just spending money like crazy and they're cutting the revenues like crazy. And 
they're spending more money in war than we ever have in like the time I've been doing this, they don't care about budgets at all. So that's the thing too. You can stand for balanced budgets, but when you look at what they're actually doing, you have to make sure that the principles match the actions and they don't. But don't Republicans usually stand for having a, a strong army and being the, the world power? Oh yeah, but so do the Democrats. They do, really? Which, yeah, that's what I learned in the last administration because the Obama administration, they overthrew Libya and we also had a hand in what happened in Ukraine and that government changed. So it's like the W. Bush administration was far more obvious about taking over governments, but Obama did it too. And that was really disappointing to me. So there's really no party right now out of the big two that I can say is is representing me. You know, it's, I don't I, it is. It's there's so many layers to it. That's like I said, I don't even know where to start with you with listening <laughs> to your shows. And and I have so many questions in ba just basic, I, I guess, how the, the government runs with the House and the Senate. I don't think the majority of people have any real clue how a bill is even passed. Like now, when we see the C-SPAN, say we're watching, I guess, how many when you read that, the what is it? Daily Digest? Yeah, the Daily Digest. How? How often are they attempting to pass new bills? Every day, pretty much. I mean, there's going to be votes Monday through Friday morning, assuming it's a week where they work the whole week, which is actually sort of rare. But they're passing stuff all the time. And that was a shock to me when I started this because they had this reputation of a do-nothing Congress. And it couldn't be further from the truth. If anything, they're doing too much. They're passing so many bills that they do not have the time to read them, which I found out the hard way. Um, the way I learned to do this is that for the first two years of my podcast, I tried to read every bill that passed the House of Representatives. And you can actually hear me lose my mind about six months into it where I'm like, this is not possible. Like they, they don't have the time to read all of the things that they're passing. And that's the most disturbing part. And that's why I like to read them myself, because that's how things are getting passed into law that we don't even know or understand. So who is writing all of these bills? There, there seems like there's not enough time and not enough people to even put all this legislation out. So from what I understand, keeping in mind that I'm not there, but from what I understand, the staff does it. Um, I've also noticed that a lot of bills come up every single year. So they're just repassing the same stuff, especially in the beginning of the Congress. And then there's also this organization, it's called ALEC, the American Legislative Exchange Council. And they are... Pra they are passing, um, they focus more on the states. They want, you know, free market type legislation that deregulates things and helps industry. And they write a lot of bills and then they get legislators to pass them into law. So it's, this is happening big time in the states. But I have seen ALEC written legislation make it through the House of Representatives in particular. And then also lobbyists are sometimes like writing legislation. There was one for the banks that actually made it into law. It was a long road, but it made it. That was written by Citigroup lobbyists. So there's a lot of people writing these bills, and it's tough to find out exactly who does it. Lobbyists, that's one topic that is super interesting. I just don't know, how is it legal for some of these lobbyists to do what they do? I do I don't know. It, and for some of them, it isn't. So for my 100th episode, I got to talk to Jack Abramoff, who was so effective in lobbying that he went to jail for it. And I kind of asked Jack, I was like, so it sounds like you just were really effective at influencing Congress, like he was buying people golf trips. And, and that's, I think, one of his beefs. He was like, yeah, I don't really <laughs> know why everyone turned their back on me, because that is the behavior that's done. And I think one of the ways that this type of bribery became legal is that the lawmakers that benefit from it are the ones that make the laws. So I don't know. I think we might have to do something at the state level, maybe. I know that um, the Young Turks, they have a thing, Wolfpack. They're trying to get a constitutional amendment to essentially make bribery illegal again, because I don't think that we can count on Congress to make their own bribes illegal it's a really really big problem but lobbyists and um and especially campaign contributions i think that's the key to all our problems i really do have you ever had a chank from the young turks on your show no i haven't i've been on the young turks a few times but only when he was on vacation so i haven't met him yet but you, i want to you should get on there you should have alex jones and chank on at the same time Oh, God, you ever, can you imagine they have, <laughs> moderating that? <laughs> they've had some serious – and I've seen Cenk um, – I've seen him debate Ben Shapiro, too, I think just almost maybe a year ago, 
And Chank just gets super emotional the whole time. It's crazy to me. Well, and the thing is, like, I'm really struggling to control my emotions, too. Because <laughs> watching this stuff every day, I'm telling you, the last two weeks, I've had a really tough time. I've been focusing on war things. And um, and it's really hard for me to then turn on the television and no one's talking about this stuff. And <laughs> I get a little crazy, too. It's, it's but you're, weird. But aren't you, like you say, you feel like you're balanced and you're just looking in, in, from almost like an outsider's perspective. Cenk is, is hard line one side, isn't he? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's almost like when Ben Shapiro would, regardless if you like Ben Shapiro or Chank more, whatever, uh, the I I guess can understand when Ben Shapiro just sits there and riles him up and just stays super calm, at least on the outside, and, and just spits facts at him. I mean, yeah. I, that's why I don't really have a show where I have those types of conversations, though, because I don't really want to get into a partisan bitch fest. It's just not what I do. Um, yeah, I just kind of want to see what's going on and – when I'm doing my show in my head, I'm talking to my little sister because mm -hmm. she's she's basic. She wants to know what's going on in the world, but she's not into the fighting. She's just like, what's happening? So I'm really talking to her. I'm trying to put it in terms that anyone can understand because I'm not all that smart myself. So until I can put it into simple terms, then I don't really understand it. And I really just want to say this is what I've noticed that's happening. I'm explaining to it. I'm explaining it as if I'm talking to a friend. And I really like to leave it at there. So I'll guest on shows like that, but I'm not really trying to have another screaming fest in politics. I don't think it has to be that way. Well, I don't think they get a whole lot done. They can talk for five hours straight, and neither of them are really going to come off of their, their speaking points and their point of view usually. Exactly. And I want the freedom to change my mind, you know? That's a that's a that, that's one thing that is looked at like a bad thing when someone flip-flops and changes their mind, and it's – if you really think about it, it's a good thing that somebody looks, okay, well, I thought this way for 20 years. Someone presented the facts to me. They showed me. They opened my eyes, and now I feel this way, and I, I changed my mind. And when you're – it's almost like in politics, that's a bad thing. See, I think we have to rethink the way we look at politics. I think a lot of the framing of it, this red versus blue, left versus right thing is meant for ratings – where what politics should be is we all share this government, we should be using it to solve our problems, which means that we have to have calm conversations and not divide into teams. And so that's kind of what I'm trying to do is just be like, hey, I'm on Team America. Don't really care what color you paint yourself. I'm not going to paint myself anywhere. And what's beautiful is I'm finding that there's a lot of people, a lot of people that feel the same way that feel completely isolated from the, from the red versus blue thing there's a lot of us in the middle and when you look at the numbers a lot of us aren't voting because you really have the extremes that are voting there are about half of us voting right now and half that feel completely unrepresented i'm really trying to talk to that half the people that feel unrepresented that would like to solve problems but don't want to get in a fight i don't think politics has to be fight Good luck. I feel like we may be a little too far along to really change or make drastic changes. Maybe with all the information out there and the different avenues to consume content, yeah, you can get people to change their mind. But man, aren't we aren't we just too far down the rabbit hole now? And it's just especially with the uh, Trump being so polarizing, it's just so much left against right. I don't think so. I really don't. I think the internet is the key to that because when I see the left versus right, it's on the television. Mm -hmm. I don't really experience it in my day-to-day -day life. I feel like I have friends from all over the ideological spectrum and I can sit down and find common ground with every single one of them. And then you listen to, I don't know about you, but I'm a fan of Joe Rogan's podcast. Oh, yeah. And he, yeah, he has really good conversations with people all the time. And I feel like we're getting somewhere being allowed to have these free form conversations amongst each other now because I don't know our generation you seem as young as I am like we're not really getting our news from the television anymore I think that's a baby boomer thing so I actually have a lot of hope in our generation and younger because they're consuming content from this beautiful internet we have here and looking for information from different sources I think it's going to help a lot so if you do watch tv and you watch the news what what channel would you watch cnn msnbc fox news which one I click around but I watch it as almost like research just to see what's being said. So when I turn on Fox, it's like, okay, so what's the right wing propaganda today? And what is Trump hearing? That's the weirdest thing about Fox is he's watching Fox and friends and like contributing to the conversation he calls on his in. Twitter. He calls in on the morning, morning show a lot, doesn't he? Yeah, it's so weird. So sometimes I'll watch that just to be like, what messages is he being fed? Um, I watch MSNBC mainly to see how hysterical they're about Russia today. 
And then CNN, I just watch for pure entertainment because their <laughs> graphics are always different. And But yeah, I'm not watching it for information. Almost never. A lot of people are though, aren't they? Yes. And it's concerning. But again, it's older people. Yeah. It's older people. It's my parents. Like it's my husband's parents. I watch, I go into their houses and for some reason that generation always has the TV on. And a lot of times it's just on the news. They're not even watching it. They just have it on the background. And then the other place I'm noticing it because I can't escape it is hotels and airports, which is frustrating. I'll be sitting there like listening to a hearing while watching CNN and the disconnect between the two is mind boggling to me. So that's why I find myself feeling crazier when I travel a lot just because I can't escape the the television. <laughs> <laughs> Those uh, congressional hearings it reminded me of a, I listened to an episode of uh, Dave Rubin's show, and I can't think of the guy's name who was the guest. He used he was the head of FEMA during Hurricane Katrina. Do you know who? Oh, he is? Oh, Michael Brown, maybe. Yeah, and he he he. Uh, I I started looking him up after I listened, and he caught a lot of heat and ended up getting pushed out of that position. And he was just talking about how the hearings that they do are just a complete farce, and they're scripted. The the questions are given to both sides, and the answers are given, and they're just not even a real thing. It's true, but sometimes you can learn a lot from the ones that are not on C-SPAN. Those are my favorites. Those are the ones where real conversations happen. Like, for instance, there's a um, there's a committee. It's called the House Rules Committee, and th every single bill that goes to the House of Representatives to get a vote has to go through the Rules Committee first. And there's I think maybe 10 or 11 people on the committee and no one ever watches their hearings. And so you can have some real conversations happen in there. Like I've heard them say they've sworn at each other before and they've gotten in real fights. I love the rules committee. And all I have to do is tape my screen to get the audio for that because you can't get it on C-SPAN. So I just run my screen capture software and that's how I get the audio for for those hearings, but I'm looking for hearings that aren't on C-SPAN because what you're saying is absolutely true. If it's a hearing that you're watching, especially the ones that get picked up by Fox or CNN and kind of run at the same time, you already know exactly what's coming out of there. But that said, sometimes they go for like eight hours and at the end, something will be said, they'll slip, you know, it's, you can get information from them, but it just takes a long time to listen to them. So why do they even have these hearings if the, everyone knows the questions and answers going in? Is it just for the general public to say, hey, look, we're, we are holding these people accountable? Maybe. I don't really know. Like I said, I'm not there. So, hmm. um, But sometimes you get good information. Like Remember when Equifax leaked like all of our social security numbers it's pretty much every yeah. adult in the united states has their social security numbers out there that hearing was good i did a whole episode on it because that was congress trying to hold the you know the powerful people in that company accountable and get answers out of those those types of investigations are really really good where you get less information is um like there was a hearing where they had all of the head spooks so like the head of the intelligence community, the head of the CIA, they go in and they testify. You're learning nothing there because they're just going to say, oh, well, we'll just talk about this in the closed session, which is the classified one that we can't hear. So I don't even bother with those. You just over time, I've learned what's worth my time and what isn't. So what what's uh, FISA? That's how you pronounce it, right? FISA? Yeah, that's um that started in the 1970s. It's a court that was set up because they basically wanted to spy <laughs> without getting warrants. And so this was kind of the, the compromise to let law enforcement do that. So basically the law enforcement agencies could go to these somewhat secret courts because at the time you couldn't even find out really anything about them, but they did have to go to a judge to get the warrants. And so that's how it started. But now it's just gotten, it's gotten completely out of control after the Patriot Act and, yeah, they, they've made it very easy for law enforcement to spy on us without having to get a warrant or warrants so easy that they basically don't even matter. Digitally now, right? They don't. Do they used to need a, a warrant to tap your cell phone? It obviously used to be landlines. Now, can't they just dial up and pull up all of your information if they feel like you, are, you made a threat? Or they, they can basically come up with anything to grab your info, can't they? It's really unclear because there's what it says on paper and then that's what there's what they're doing in reality. So, for instance, in the George W. Bush administration, they did make some of this legal, but they were setting up a data center that was literally taking all of the information that went over the telecoms wires. And so this is what we learned from Edward Snowden. They were taking the information. So it was just everything and copying it directly to the NSA. And then they were storing that information. So they were 
collecting all of our digital in- information. Now, there's been some laws that have been passed since then that have technically made that illegal, but there's so many loopholes that at this point, I'm just kind of assuming that they are at least able to tap into maybe even collecting everything I do digitally. I mean, that's the safest way to operate because they were doing that at one point. So I don't know. And what's crazy about the Bush administration, setting up that spying network was illegal. And on their way out the door, Congress made all of it, gave all of them retroactive immunity. So I don't know what's legal and what's illegal anymore. It's really hard to figure out. So for people that have lived under a rock for 15 years, what exactly did Edward Snowden do to uh, expose what the government was doing? So Edward Snowden was a contractor. Um, which is something gets lost in the story a lot. The NSA, the people that are spying on us are not necessarily government employees. So he was working for Booz Allen Hamilton, which is a contractor, which gets most of their money from the U.S. government. It might as well be a part of us, but it's not. It's private and for profit. And so he was working for them and he was able to basically download thousands and thousands of documents that were proving that this spying apparatus had been set up and we were spying on the entire world digitally and collecting that information. And so he took that information to journalists who then decided what was going to be published and what wasn't. But we basically got some very interesting details about the cooperation between the government and these giant corporations, you know, um, Apple and Facebook and AT&T and Verizon. I mean, giant companies how they were helping the government to set up this spying and they all have immunity for it. No one's gotten in trouble for it, but he let us know that, yeah, everything that's going on digitally, they're taken. So Hmm. what the question now is what do they, what are they allowed to use in court? And what I've discovered recently is it's a lot. (laughs) If they can find it, they can use it. It's, it's disturbing. So what, but what would a company say people at Apple, I don't know how high up the government would have to go to get that info. But if you're uh, one of the execs at Apple and you get contacted by the NSA, some high end government things, how could you turn them down if they say, Hey, this is for national security and we we need you to share this information with us. What are they supposed to do? I don't know, but uh, Qualcomm did it. That company, the only reason I know what Qualcomm is, is they had the charger stadium, but um, it was a, so we haven't heard of them since, since San Diego, since the chargers moved, we haven't heard of Qualcomm. (laughs) But that was the thing. You haven't heard of Qualcomm since their company got just screwed because they said no to the government. All of a sudden, contracts evaporated, and and they actually did pay a real price. And then, yes, San Diego disappeared and <laughs> went up to L.A. <laughs> but, um, but, yeah, there were companies that did say no and did try to fight for, you know, the First Amendment and all and the Fourth Amendment, and they just – they got in trouble. So, yeah, a lot of them – They did participate in this, and that's why the retroactive immunity became so important in 2008 as the Bush administration was on their way out the door, and they got it. So none of those companies got in any trouble. And now the way that the system works is, at least this is what it says on paper in law. I don't actually know if this is how it's working, but what's happening now is that the government is not, in theory, holding on to all our information it's the companies that have to hold on to our information and then they have immunity for turning it over to the government. So that's what the USA Freedom Act did. It was supposed to be the solution to a lot of these problems that we have with our privacy being violated in this way. So their solution was basically to privatize the storage of our information, but the companies can turn it over with not, the companies do not have to be afraid of us suing them because we are not legally allowed to anymore. Now, do these companies get, uh, paid big chunks of cash from the government to store that info? God, I would love to find those numbers, but yes, they do get paid. Hmm. Is that like the uh, couple years ago, was it, when we found an airplane with a couple billion dollars going to Iran or something? Wasn't there a bunch of cash they found from the Obama era? Oh, I don't know. There was a bunch I remember of, what you're talking about, but I don't remember I forget what, what it was. A couple billion or something that was not accounted for and all of a sudden it was supposedly going to Iran I don't know obviously I'm speaking out of school here but there was something like that a couple years back when Obama was still in office and it was around for a while you you heard people talk about it and then everything like everything the news cycle is so quick bam it dies off and it's never heard from again it disappears but I do know that our money disappears because I um I like to read through the defense funding because I'm insane (laughs) and um they get tens of billions of dollars in classified money, which means we have absolutely no idea where it goes. There's there's classified money? I've never heard of that. 
Oh, yeah. Tens of billions of dollars. I mean, mm. the last time that I checked, it's been years, but the last time I checked, in just the Defense Department funding alone, there was $80 billion that we were not allowed to know where it goes. So, <laughs> yeah, classified funding, so much of our money, we're not allowed to know what they're doing with it. So could there be a bunch of backpacks full of cash on a plane going to Iran? Is that possible? Yup. <laughs> because in Iraq in 2003 through 2008, I actually know people who were grunts on the ground, who were in charge of delivering backpacks full of cash to local Iraqis. Like that happened. <laughs> so yeah, we don't know what they're doing with our money. And there's never been an audit of the Defense Department. We're getting our first one this year, first one ever. And who knows how much we're gonna learn from that. But yeah, they we give them money for war and then it just disappears. <laughs> Well, I guess that, that's part of it, too. I guess on the ground, you're saying you, you knew people that were delivering backpacks of cash to local tribesmen, I would imagine. I, I know we uh, a big thing over in Afghanistan and Iraq, I think we would, we would take them Viagra. Those dudes loved Viagra. They were, uh, they'd have five or seven, <laughs> ten wives, and they loved that when we would bring them Viagra, and it would create the relationship, and then they would tell us where the Taliban was. Well, five to seven wives is a lot of work. <laughs> yeah, and especially those guys, a lot of them don't look very young, so they need it. Yeah, yeah. Well, at least we're bringing some kind of happiness to the people in the Middle yeah. East. So a bag of <laughs> a big bag, one big bag of cash and one big bag of Viagra. I wonder which one goes for more over there. I know, right? That would be a good thing to find out. Man, that's So are you are you into any conspiracy theories? I mean, the truth is so much more interesting <laughs> to me. Just because, like, how is this stuff real? But some of it sounds like a conspiracy theory. Like, my entire theory on why we're fighting all these wars sounds like a conspiracy theory until you hear Hillary Clinton and Joe Biden and John McCain and Condoleezza Rice talking about it. But I essentially am running on the, the theory that the people in charge of our government and in charge of governments on our side around the world are trying to get the entire world under one economic system. And they're doing it through the World Trade Organization, through the International Monetary Fund. Um, but that is why we're fighting all over the world, because we're the muscle for their economic system. And they talk about it all the time. But the phrase world order, it sounds so Alex Jones, but that's the phrase they use. And they have been for a very long time. And so I've started tracking that. And sometimes I do feel like I need to put on my tinfoil hat and check myself into a rubber room. But then I watched them talk about it. These are extremely powerful people. And I'm convinced that this is this is really happening. But yeah, so it's the truth is just so much more fun for me than, you know, chemtrails. <laughs> so what what is a new world or what is the, the world new world order? What does that look like? What does that mean when they you hear that? So it started right after World War II, and it took me like five years to find the start point, but I finally figured it out. It's right after World War II. So we went in, and we were the only country that really was untouched. You know, we lost Pearl Harbor, but that was it. Our mainland was fine. Our manufacturing was fine. And so because we were the country that was fine, we got together with our allies, and we decided – and the idea behind it, it's a good intention – what they think is that if every country in the world is trading with each other and is economically connected, then they would be incentivized not to fight with each other and there will be peace on earth. Sounds a little simplistic to me, but that is the, the what they are operating on. And so that's when they set up these institutions. Um, it started with the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund. They wanted to do the World Trade Organization at the same time, but they actually didn't pull that off until the 1990s. But now all three are in, in existence. And those three organizations, ever since the 1940s, they've been trying to – they do it through trade agreements. And you're seeing those get bigger and bigger and bigger. But they're trying to get the whole world connected economically. But yeah, it started in World War II, after right, right after World War II. What about the military uh, industrial complex? You do a lot of work on that? I mean, yeah, because it's connected to everything. So like my last episode, I was talking about how we're replacing our entire nuclear weapons infrastructure, which you think is something that they would tell us on the news, but nope. So we're going to spend $1.2 trillion replacing all of it. And when I looked into the details of it, like we're going to replace all of our nuclear bombers, for instance. Northrop Grumman is the only company that's able to buy or produce these specific planes. 
And so they have plants where they've hired a lot of people, but the parts come from all over the country. And so that's how you get all of these representatives from all over the place to say that this is in our interest because it's jobs and it's paychecks. That It's a brilliant strategy, but every single district is infected with making parts for war. And so, yeah, I mean, I have to cover that stuff. And as much as I can discover how it works in the private sector, it helps. But again, the way that the private contractors and the government are now kind of the same thing in certain aspects, these private companies are allowed to keep things private that the government otherwise wouldn't be able to. So contracting out a lot of this work too also keeps a lot of it secret. It's and makes a lot of profits for the people in those companies. So the way I see it is that money comes from my pocket, goes towards these wars, but a lot of that money goes into private pockets as well because we're contracting out so much of the work. So contracting is a huge, huge issue that we don't talk about nearly enough in this country. Well, how do they keep these private companies, how do they keep people working there that know we're making all of these this bomb making material, whatever it may be, how do they keep people quiet? I, I know anytime there's more than two people involved, it seems like someone's going to snitch and tell their wife, their wife's going to post it on Facebook. How do we keep this under wraps? I don't think they're quiet about it at all. That's why I'm able to do my show. I mean, when I look into what are these new planes, I found out about them because I went to Northrop Grumman's website. They had a whole video bragging about them. Like, <laughs> it's not quiet at all, but no one's looking. Like what I'm doing, I'm doing everything that I'm doing from my home office. I was doing it from my kitchen table for four years, but I've done it from Boston. I've done it from the mountains of Oregon. I'm doing it now from Oakland. Like I'm doing something that any journalist in the country could do. It's all available online. The difference is they're not. And so if we, <laughs> you know, wanted to know this information, it's available. Well, don't you think Not there's a, secret. a thing that, that helps the government there is that the fact the Internet, yes, we can find it all, but there's so much out there that people aren't really going to dig like you are. I mean, some people are. The journalists at The Intercept, now that The Intercept is a thing, they have been fantastic. Um, you know, th there are people doing it. I think the trouble that we're having is that the corporate media – you know, when you look at the money that gets spent on these campaigns, if you track where it goes, it goes from, you know, the companies or the, the corporations, whoever is c donating to these candidates, the candidates take all of that money. So let's take Donald Trump, for instance. He collected probably a, at least half a billion dollars. That Well, down, actually, I shouldn't say Donald Trump because we'll say Hillary Clinton. She's a better example. She collects a billion dollars. Most of that money goes to television and print ads which means that all of this money that's infecting our politics goes directly to the media. They're completely connected. So when you think about money in politics, you have to think about that money in media as well because that's what they're buying with it. They're buying commercials, which means that their customers are the candidates, not us. So that's why independent media in particular is so important, funded by just regular people like you and me because they are incentivized to not tell the stories that I'm telling. Like imagine... If, if Watch this. When you start watching TV now, start watching the commercials, you'll notice that Raytheon, Northrop Grumman, Boeing, these companies have commercials. Why would they have commercials? Are you going to buy an airplane? <laughs> <laughs> like, no, that's not for you. That's money being funneled to the media. So if Northrop Grumman is paying these companies, and there's only six really that control all our corporate media, if these companies are paying the corporate media – why would the corporate media turn around and tell you what I just told you about Northrop Grumman? You know, mm -hmm. like, why would they do anything to make these executives mad? They're not going to. So instead, they're going to have a two-week conversation about guns in schools, <laughs> you know, like, and, and which is, it's an important issue, but so is replacing our nuclear weapons infrastructure, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So, yeah, they're incentivized to not tell us things. But hasn't that model possibly been changed a little bit by Donald Trump. He kind of went around it in whether people admit it or not, I guess, through Twitter, through social media, he he continues to tweet. But throughout the campaign, he, he was going, and it's free for him to, to tweet out to, to all of his followers. And we all know that he only he doesn't like the media and how, how he speaks about them. Can't Is it shifting now? Because like you said, older people, my parents are, are watching the news when they get home. I've I can't imagine anyone under the age of 35 is coming home and turning on the local news or even CNN, MSNBC. 
very often. So isn't it shifting towards internet and towards, I guess, just getting the information to the people? I hope so. That's what I'm counting on. Because I'm not going to keep doing this if I think we're all doomed. I really do think we have something special going on in the internet as long as we can protect it. Because they're aware of it now. That's what's concerning me is since 2016, since Hillary lost, I think they are now looking at the internet as a threat. Who's that? Because it was just like the powerful people. So, for instance... Yeah, who's powerful? I've, like, who who would be powerful? Like, here? members of Congress, senators, representatives, um, not necessarily a Trump administration, but, you know, like, the CIA member, like, the, the people that are pulling the strings. These people are old. <laughs> There's very few people that are under the age of five or 35 in that category of people. And so I think the internet was kind of this thing they weren't worried about until Hillary lost because her emails made it out on the internet and because the DNC emails made it out on the internet. Now they're taking the internet seriously and you're seeing a major push by politicians to encourage Facebook and Twitter and YouTube to censor the internet. And you're seeing it happen too. I mean, YouTube yeah. just did a purge and people are getting kicked off Twitter and we all know this is happening. Congress is encouraging that. And so we need to protect the internet and not fall for you know, the lies that they're spinning that it's all for our protection, you know, like ISIS is going to get you through Facebook. Like, <laughs> and now it's Russia. They switched from ISIS to Russia. So um, we need to protect the Internet because this is where all my hope lies. As soon as they shut this down, <laughs> I'm moving to Chile or something. Well, everybody, <laughs> <laughs> Chile, everybody's screwed. <laughs> everybody's screwed. If the Internet gets shut down, it'd be a tough thing to do. But now you said we're going to rebuild our nuclear arsenal it just recently uh putin came out and said we have nuclear missiles that can bypass all of your defenses so now it's what are we yeah. gonna put three billion into the infrastructure yeah he said that this morning which uh-oh yeah we're gonna do and it's actually 1.2 trillion is the, mm. the number that so they want to bump it up replace it. Let's bump yeah 1.2 trillion that's an enormous amount of money but if he is if putin is if he truly does have these missiles, we have to somehow defend ourselves, though. Well, he said he had nuclear-powered missiles, which is different from nuclear weapons. That is one thing that, although I just saw it through the tweets from the... You can follow the president of Russia on Twitter. So they were live tweeting his speech this morning. So I don't know if that was lost in translation or what, but that would actually be different if it's powered with nuclear power and if it's holding a nuclear warhead. Those are different things. But, I mean, we've known that Russia has nuclear weapons since, I don't know, at least the 1950s. And we have enough already to blow up the entire world. So I don't really see how this is a game changer, but we're sure going to spend a lot of money to make all our weapons shiny and new and to expand our nuclear weapon system. And, you know, I think this is at least a conversation that should be had before we just do it. So going uh, somewhat of a conspiracy model, let's, let's think the government knows that they need $1.2 trillion to revamp our nuclear arsenal. What if there is, someone is in bed with Putin and said, hey, just throw this out there. This is really going to help us put this over the top where we're going to get our money, no questions asked. And sometimes I wonder, you know, because although when I look at why Russia would be saying this stuff, it actually makes a lot of sense to me because we have been very aggressive. We've built up our military since 20, I think it was the NDA of 2015. I've read so many now I can't even remember, but it was relatively recently that we authorized a huge military buildup on Russia's border, like up in the top <clears throat> section in the, like the cold part, Latvia, Estonia, um, Lithuania. We've been building up our military there. We just authorized this past December a military buildup in the Pacific region. We don't know exactly where that's going to be, but we're basically now going to have a military buildup on both sides of Russia. And since World War II, NATO has really been, at least since the Cold War, branded as a counter to Russia. And it's been expanding now to the point that it's on their border. And so that's a threat to them. It really is. And so to and we did help overturn the government of Ukraine, which is their next door neighbor. And it was very much in Russia was very much involved in that because the government of Ukraine had decided against partnering with the EU economically. They were going to sign something in November of 2013. Instead of signing that, they decided to partner with Russia. And that's when their government got overturned. And so that's a direct threat to Russia, you know, and then the minute the new government was in, they signed that deal with the EU. And that's that's their next door neighbor. Imagine if Russia was screwing around with Canada in the same way. If they came in, had a hand in replacing the government and the new government was anti-USA, very clearly anti-USA, 
how would we react? So watching Russia speak this way, I can at least understand it. But we're not surrounded by Russian troops. You know, like we, that's not our situation. So I unfortunately see us as the aggressors here. And I can see why Russia would be talking up their nuclear weapons to be like, hey, stop moving up to our borders and maybe stop putting your military all over the place. Like it is a threatening thing that we're doing. It's, you know, I, I wonder what the answer is. I don't, I don't know. I mean, I, of course I want, I think the U S I, I love it here. We have freedom compared to all a bunch of, I mean, there's a lot of horrendous places to live in the world. So what we can do here, I mean, the fact that you can do your show and your a sniper doesn't shoot you through your window while you're recording yet. is a great thing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It's a good thing. So I, I like that. It's true. We need to at least we need to be able to defend ourselves and be strong and let people know you can't mess with America. You can't have we can't have another Pearl Harbor, nine eleven, all of that. But I wonder, did you have you ever felt threatened, or have you ever got any weird emails or anyone whisper to you while you're walking by? Okay, keep it down. Stop digging. Not yet. Um, I did get a guy trying to be my friend or whatever on LinkedIn and I don't do LinkedIn. I'm a podcaster, but he's in the military intelligence something. And I'm like, no, I'm not going to know you. You scare me. (laughs) So no, no one's threatened me yet. But I think the reason too is that I'm, I'm respectful in what I do. I don't call people names. I don't really do the yelling thing. I just say, this is what it is. I'm using publicly available documents. Like I'm not, I'm not Edward Snowden. I'm not taking classified information and leaking it. I'm taking stuff that is on the internet already in the most boring of locations. I mean, on my my bar, my bookmarks bar, I have like house.gov, <laughs> senate.gov. Like that's where I'm getting my stuff from, C-SPAN. So I also don't think I'm that big of a threat. Yeah. Although we'll see. Yeah, yeah. yeah. If I do it right, I will be, but... That's right. Do you think that happens? Do you think they really reach out to people and, and shut them down? I know I keep bringing up Alex Jones, but he speaks of how he has guys in unmarked black suburbans following him around. and all. Do you think they really do that? Do they send people out to private citizens that are broadcasting information or putting documents out? Not like Edward Snowden, but other people that uh, it's not technically illegal. Do they do they send people yeah. out to shut them up? I know they do. I know they do. In fact, I just um, talked to a podcaster and I won't air his name, but I was just talking to a podcaster who's been doing this. He's been in radio forever and ever and ever. And then I I don't know if he said it was the eighties or nineties, but he started getting magazine cutouts, like threatening, like people were cutting out the letters and sending him this weird stuff he was getting at his office. And then he eventually got one on his car and he was noticing that vans were parked outside of his house and he thought it was super weird. And so about 10 years later, he did a freedom of information request about himself and he got his file and he found out it was the FBI that was doing that stuff. So yeah, um, they do these things, which actually makes me kind of, if it does happen, I think I'll be a little bit more comforted just because I just talked to him on Monday. So they obviously didn't kill him. He's fine. But do they try and intimidate people to get them to shut up? Yeah, they sure do. That's so real. so what are, what are your thoughts on... Um, what happened to Seth Rich, the guy who, for people who don't know, do you or do you remember him? Can you explain to people yep. exactly who he was and what allegedly happened? He's dead. Either way, he's dead. But what people say, he could have been the WikiLeaks, one of the the guys, I guess, what, taking – he was a, a source for WikiLeaks? It possibly. I mean, Julian Assange basically told us that he was – Um, This has to do with the DNC emails. So the DNC is the Democratic National Committee, and they essentially, I don't want to say they rigged it, but they made the rules of their primary unfair, and they allowed the Clintons to financially control the Democratic Party well before Hillary Clinton won the primary. So it really was unfair to the other candidates, not just Bernie, but also Martin O'Malley and everyone else who was running to, to get that nomination. And Seth Rich worked at the DNC and he was a Bernie supporter and right before he died. And I can't remember the exact timeline, but I'm going to say it was within two weeks. He didn't just die. He was killed. Yeah. He, um, so about two weeks before he was killed, those emails that were exposing this behavior from the DNC were given to WikiLeaks. Next thing you know, Seth Rich, four o'clock in the morning, he's murdered in the middle of the street. They said it was a botched robbery, but nothing was taken from him. Um, Then Julian Assange offered a reward for him and said, you know, our sources take a lot of risks. It it didn't 
quite come out and say he's one of our sources, but was clearly upset and named Seth Rich by name. And so there is good reason to think that he might have been the source of those emails. And to this day, Julian Assange says it was not the Russians that gave us these emails. He's never varied from that. And yet that is what launched this entire Mueller investigation. They're saying that this was a Russian hack. Where really it might have been an American kid saying there's something very corrupt going on in the DNC. And maybe he gave the emails to WikiLeaks. There is reason to think that that is possible, but we don't know. And this is all being dismissed as a conspiracy theory, but I, it looks real bad. And I wish we could have a real investigation into that, but we're not getting one. Yeah. His, his situation, it's just scary. That that's one that really scares me. I, obviously he's on, if he was the leak for, from the DNC to WikiLeaks and yeah, that's some high level, not espionage, but some high level, information he is leaking to Julian Assange that they do not want out. So, man, but to think a guy like that, it's four in the morning, he's walking, and as you said, he's he's killed, and it's a botched robbery. The dude still has his wallet and keys and everything on him when they find his body. So it just, it yeah. just looks too – it's like a movie. It's like an episode of House of Cards. And if I understand correctly, I think he was shot in the back too. Jeez. So it wasn't like he was fighting with someone. Like, he was just murdered. And so – but again, like, when I think about my own safety – I'm not going into the private files of the people in one of the top two parties and giving those that they think are supposed to be private. You know, I'm not doing that. I'm using publicly available information. So there is a difference there. But yeah, I, it, yeah, that terrifies me. And this is what I'm saying. The Democrats and Republicans, that apparatus, like both of those parties scare the hell out of me. They've gotten way too powerful and they're way too cocky. And they're the ones that perpetuate the lie that we have a two-party system. That's not true. There was nowhere in the Constitution that said that you have to vote for a Democrat and you have to vote for a Republican. Like, no, we had the Whigs. <laughs> the Whigs were a thing and then they weren't. So we can, with our votes, eliminate both of these parties if we want to. We just have to have the balls to vote for people that aren't in them. So what so. did the DNC do to to Bernie Sanders? It was I think it's an embarrassing situation for him that he finds out that they basically suppressed stuff that he could do. They they prop Hillary up, they make it tough for him to make it, and then Bernie still comes out. I guess people could call him mate, oh he's a true Amer or patriot because he's still basically after he finds this information out, he takes the podium and says it's still a good candidate. Make make sure you vote for Hillary or, or whatever. After he realizes I've just been screwed by this party that I thought I was going to be all right. Well, the day after the convention, he did go back to being an independent, <laughs> so he's not a Democrat, and I'm sure he's privately angry, but he's always been a team player, Like, and that's one of the things that irritates me about him, actually. I wish he was more of a fighter, and I hope if he runs in 2020, he, he'll run as an independent. Come on. There's no way he's running, is he? Oh, yeah. Is he going to make it? How old is he? He looks older than he is. I think he's 76. I think he acts older than he is. Oh, yeah, but he's, a... he's looked like that for my whole life. <laughs> he, yeah. He's looked like that forever. But, um, but yeah, they essentially, and I understand how it happened. The DNC had basically bankrupted themselves. They had no money left, and Hillary had a ton from her failed <laughs> bid in 2008. So she essentially gave the DNC a loan but got power over their decisions, like their financial decisions, their communication decisions. Her campaign was running the Democratic Party, but during the primaries. And so how anyone could even say that that's fair, I don't even understand. And so that they were in charge of um, they had veto power over who the communications director would be. And in the emails, we learned that they were communicating things like looking for things to harm Bernie Sanders, like. She had been chosen by the party insiders, which we had suspected the whole time. But the fact that it's been proven is part of the problem. And what's really been interesting for me to look at it, it because, you know, the Republicans and the Democrats, they get to choose our top two. Right. Mm -hmm. So why do we allow these private clubs to make their rules? Because when they got challenged in court, they actually got up there and their defense was, well, we're allowed to rig the primary. We're private. We can make our own rules. So if we are going to have this thing, like why do we allow these parties to control the narrowing down of our, our candidates? Because they've obviously proven they can't be trusted. Although, strange, strangely enough, the Republicans proved that they their system's pretty fair because <laughs> none <laughs> of them wanted Donald Trump. So um, 
But yeah, that's the question ever since this. It's it's a bigger thing than just the Democrats to me. It's why are we allowing private clubs to make these essential rules for how we pick our president? Maybe that's something else we have to fix. Do you think Hillary, Hillary will run again in 2020? Oh, God, I hope she doesn't. I am so over her. Why? I really Why are you over her? Why? What's wrong with Hillary? Oh, so much. <laughs> so much. She's, um, I think her ties, I know you, that's why I wanted to ask you if you've done much work on like the Clinton Foundation and looked into that and the whole crazy weird uranium one deal we I, I don't I just know the like the headline information about all of it but it's so deep and detailed of how many years it goes back of how powerful the the Clinton Foundation and Bill Clinton and Hillary like how they've surrounded themselves with all these different huge players all across the world that's what scares me is like people can you can say oh Donald Trump is ignorant and he tweets stupid things but Hillary what she could do is very scary like that's different than being just uh, people think you're dumb if you're Donald Trump I don't think people feel like he has too much power Hillary I feel like that would be scary if she got in I don't know what it would look like yeah. I don't know if she had should can really change things it seems like once a president gets in they can't really make the 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 moves that they wanted to before they they had the curtain to open up and see how difficult it is but. I don't know. Like, what is the Clinton Foundation? Is it a thing anymore? I don't really know about the Clinton Foundation. Um, I know that Bill and Hillary were collecting massive amounts of money from it and from people that were not even Americans. Like, I know the Saudis, there was a lot of money. But I didn't even need the Clinton Foundation to know that I couldn't vote for her because I know her record. You know, she was a senator. So she voted for the Patriot Act. She voted for the Iraq War. She was, when as Secretary of State, she was one of the key people that made the decision to go and overturn. I say overturn, but like they really replaced the government of Libya, which is still a nightmare. It's still a civil war down there. It was never solved. They just got rid of a guy who was challenging their economic system. Is that, was um, that good, uh, Gaddafi? Gaddafi? Gaddafi, yeah. When they were... I oh did man! An episode How nasty on that was Libya that? Thing. When they were the, all of a sudden, this dude's a huge dictator, and then the next thing we know, there's cell phone videos of them ramming stakes in his ass and stuff. That was horrible. Yeah, and she laughed about it. This yeah, is she a man did. that she had met. She, she had did. shook his hand. She had had dinners with him, and she's laughing about him getting killed like that. Like, if you're gonna go and order an assassination. At least be human enough to feel bad about it, you know? But she's, yeah, she scares the hell out of me. And it was all about her record for me. I mean, she was one of the instrumental people as Secretary of State that was f pushing fracking all over the world. Um, she, oh, there was a treaty that was negotiated under her watch to allow deep water drilling even deeper in the Gulf of Mexico than where the deep water horizon spill happened. Like, she is not what she says she is. And I can prove it with documents and treaties. And so, yeah, I did a, I did two episodes about the election last year and I just said I couldn't vote for either of these people, you know, and oh, the wrath of the Hillary voters. Woo, that was unpleasant. But honestly, she scares me in a different way. And the, the main thing, the reason I couldn't vote for her, she was promising to double down in the war in Syria. She wanted to replace that government so bad, and she had told the masters of the universe at the Council of Foreign Relations, if you really want to blow your mind, watch some of their meetings. But she told them, like, we are going to do no-fly zones, and the people that were flying there were Russians, which means you're going to shoot down Russian planes. That's pretty serious. But she wanted that regime change done. She's crazy. So <laughs> I really hope she does not run again because I can't vote for her in 2020 either. Now, why would what would be her motivation for things like that? Is it because she has these relationships all over and she has to promise certain things to all these different world leaders so it's a give and take deal? It's world order. To really put it in those two, it's what I told you before. She is definitely one of those people, as is Bill Clinton, because it was Bill Clinton that was – he was one of the people that signed the, the treaties and everything that made the World Trade Organization a thing. Um they are people that truly believe that world peace will happen when the entire world is controlled and economically integrated into the world trade system. So it's like this is this is their path to world peace. And if a lot of people have to die to get there, well, the ends will justify the means. But she honestly like she is one of these people that's trying to get the whole world integrated financially that's what the game is and Bashir al-Assad he's the president of Syria he is not changing the economic laws to match their system also Syria is very important for fossil fuels if you look at the map of where the pipelines go a lot of our wars make a lot more sense and a lot of them go through Syria um, 
Libya was a, a fossil fuel interesting situation too. I did an episode on Libya. If you're interested in that, that was one of the most mind blowing things I've ever done. But, um, and also like Saddam Hussein said he was going to go off the, the dollar. And if you're trying to integrate in an economic system, like you can't have different money. So that was one of his no nos. Uh, Muammar Gaddafi was going to put Africa, not just Libya, but he was the head of the African Union at the time. So he wanted all of Africa to go into a dollar tied currency that was not connected to dollars. And so next thing you know, he's gone. Like if you just follow that storyline, everything starts to fall into place and make sense. But are we, uh, the U.S., though, uh, under their that world order plan, are we the, the superpower? We're the ones pulling the strings? Yeah, I mean, it's us. It's NATO. It's the World Trade Organization. There's other countries involved for sure, but we're the muscle. That's the important part. Like, our military is the one that is keeping the peace. That's why we're in 180 countries. Um, we're all over the world. Like, we're the ones paying to enforce all of it. So yeah, we're the we're the linchpin of all of it. But it's all it's what's interesting now is since Trump was elected, they're changing their tune. They're saying that the world order is failing. And so um you know, Brexit is really interesting because the EU is an integration of all these different countries and now Great Britain is pulling out of it, which is the opposite of what these people would like to see happen. So when you're watching their puzzle pieces, it's falling apart and they're now saying it out loud that their world order is failing. And the people that are challenging that are Russia and China, Russia in particular, because in Ukraine, Russia fought back. And in Syria, we didn't finish that regime change because of Russia. They brought in their jets, which is, that's a first, you know, someone's actually fighting back against a regime change. So yeah, when you look at what they're saying to each other, it has nothing to do with social media trolls. It has everything to do with their world order and Russia challenging us in Ukraine and Syria. Those are the big deals. So is Trump going to win in 2020? Oh, I hope not. <laughs> well, who who's going to who's going to challenge him? I don't know, man. Is there a know. Republican that'll challenge him that you you could see rising up? I don't know. My crystal ball is pretty useless. <laughs> I don't really know what's going to happen in the future. I can tell you what happened in the past. But well, I tell you I what. I never would have predicted Donald Trump as president. So No, I don't think he would have predicted it. And watching the process play out, it was just it was just funny to watch it just flip back and forth. I've I've heard people say this and I was doing the same thing on election night and throughout the the process, flipping back and forth to different channels. Just just say CNN and Fox News. We're watching a Two different worlds. It's it's not even yeah. the same. It's not even the same thing that they are covering, and they're both covering the election with how they would speak on it. Even when they, when he would win a state, CNN would wait like an hour after the state was called to announce it. Yeah, it, it was, was just weird, awkward. It was really awkward. They're freaking out, crying on the desk almost. I'm thinking like, <laughs> man, I, I get that you you pick a side, but that's the problem. You're so die hard to your one side that you lose your mind. Yeah. It was really strange to watch, especially considering that neither one of these can't. I mean, they were it was bad either way presidentially. But what made me cry that night is when the Republicans got both houses of Congress. Mm. That's when I lost it, because it was like all of these horrible bills that I've been reading. He'd be able to sign them into law. So that's what broke me. It wasn't necessarily that because the president, there's a limit to what the president can do, which we're kind of seeing right now. Um, but Congress really holds most of the power. It was designed that way. So the Republicans having the whole government after the horrible behavior that I've documented for the last five years, that's what that's what broke me that night. And what was fascinating for me turning on the TV is how that really wasn't the story. It was all about the presidency once again. It's kind of like the frustration of my life that I feel like Congress is the most important and everybody wants to talk about Trump. <laughs> So you did. You weren't. Uh, you weren't one of those people that said you're moving to Canada if he wins. Oh hell no, no, because I already tried to escape. <laughs> <laughs> so in 2008, my husband and I, we weren't married at the time, but we sold everything we owned and we bought one way tickets to Europe. And then we went over there, and that's when I realized that the thing that's infecting us is infecting the whole world. Like everybody's kind of losing their rights. And I was watching, um, you know, Ireland was trying to have a vote and it was really difficult. And there were people that wanted to be a part of the EU. And and then the people that didn't were having their messages, you know, kind of censor. I mean, it's it's happening all over the world. So it's there's really nowhere you can go to escape the battle 
in trying to set up this unfair economic system. Because that's the thing, too. If their economic system had a judicial system that was fair and had a role for us whatsoever, like if we could vote, if we could pick the representatives, if there was a court that was something other than just a corporate court, maybe I could get behind the idea. But they've set up an undemocratic system that is really just for multinational corporations. And every time they overturn a government, what they're trying to do is allow these multinationals in there so that they can get in and extract profits. I mean, this is a system designed for the people who are already rich, who make their money in dividends. So as I'm watching this, it's like it matters what their system is. So that's the thing, too. Like, is world order necessarily a bad thing? Like, I don't know. Like we're at the point now that we can talk to people all over the world. Maybe we should come upon some common set of rules that we'll all live by. But the rules that they've made, not these. These are not good for any of us. Hmm. So, Just yeah. A, uh, I just have a couple more questions. Like I said, my, my my mind is racing listening to all of the the knowledge that you have. It was almost like, did you watch the show uh, The Crown on Netflix? Have you seen it? No, I haven't. It's on like the the Queen. Elizabeth, I guess, who's the the queen now? Hello. Yeah, I should know. I should have. I watched season one. It's always Elizabeth. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I watched season one, and it goes to from when uh, she basically became the queen. It starts out back in the day, and I don't know if it ever gets to current day or not. I'm not even on season two, but I watched the whole first season, and then it was really entertaining. But it was also like a history lesson for me because I didn't, I was not aware of really any of the inner workings of what happens over there. And they go through a lot of the stories, and that's like what listening to your your podcast is. It's almost like a, an entertaining way to know what's happening with the government. And especially because you get, I love how you get all fired up and you get pissed off and start yelling a little bit and get upset yeah. <laughs> when it's just yourself, though. It's just you right into the microphone. Yeah, I get craziest when I'm by myself. <laughs> that makes sense, I guess, when you think about yeah. it. You feel like you're just yelling, yelling at nobody into thin air? I really do. I mean, I'm sitting in the same chair and just yelling at my computer screen and I, I listened to it later. I was like, Jen, you're a crazy person. Like there's an old man that lives on the other side of this wall. God only knows what he thinks I do for a living. <laughs> uh, one I wanted to ask you quickly. Okay. Net neutrality. If I say I'm a third grader, can you explain to me what exactly is going on right now? Uh, sure. So net neutrality is the nickname for a regulation. And that's important because there's laws that are made in Congress and then regulations are made by the law enforcement agency. So it's basically like you have to enforce this law. The regulation says this is how we're going to enforce it. So net neutrality is the nickname for how the cable companies and the Internet companies were going to be regulated. And they had made some rules during the Obama administration, essentially saying that it's illegal for these cable companies to... Like, let's say, like for my podcast, if I don't pay Comcast, they could slow down my delivery to you. Or if I do pay them, then it would speed it up. So it was basically like treating internet traffic differently based on who pays. And there were, there were certain ways that they wanted to stop the internet companies from interfering in what information we get over their wires. Because I personally think that Comcast is just the wire. They shouldn't have any control over what information comes over it. So they were regulating. And I think that's the key. So what happened is they then switched the government to the Trump administration. And the Trump administration hired a corporate-friendly guy. This guy was a Verizon lawyer. And so he's now the head of the FCC. And so he's retracting that regulation. But the point for me is that This is all based on laws that were written really in the 1930s. It's all about how do we classify the Internet? Is it a telecommunication system or an information system? Well, the definitions for those were before computers were even invented. So we're operating on really, really old laws. And until we fix the laws, it's all about how the current administration decides to enforce them. So whatever Trump is doing now is temporary. Because we can just put in a new administration in 2020 and it's going to be different all over again. The solution to all of this, how we govern the Internet, is yet to be done. It's all going to happen in Congress, which means we should probably hire a younger Congress that understands the importance of the Internet and doesn't want to shut it down to make those laws. So for me personally, what I'm doing about net neutrality is absolutely nothing because I don't trust this Congress. I think they're too old and they want to shut down the Internet. They've really shown their colors on that in the last six to eight months. I mean, it's been pretty bad. Um, 
So I don't trust this Congress. Trump's going to do what Trump's going to do. We can switch it all in 2020, but really the solution is going to be a new law. Hmm. Okay. That's well, the, speaking of younger Congress, my, uh, I have a buddy I went to college with is running for an open seat in I guess district 16, I guess in Ohio. He, awesome. uh, he he's a really really smart dude. Um, he played football in the NFL for a while. Went to Ohio State, but he was always weirdly smart. And now he's running. He raised a bunch of money, and uh, he's on the the trail now on the the beginning parts of it. And uh, I'm looking forward. He's like thirty. He's probably thirty two, thirty three oh, max. That's fantastic. He's the son of Cuban immigrants. Uh, he's just uh, his parents came over here. Basically, I think they. They fleed on a boat. Bam, his dad built himself up at some big company through steel industry or something. He's a great story of what it would, what it, a guy that from the outside looking in should be a good guy, a guy to have up there. I hope he can win. I don't know. But it, I think, yeah, getting some younger blood, you're right, because the internet is so, it's new. We don't know. We have no idea, like, what this even is. When everything's written, what, what are you talking about? We can sit here and yeah. video talk over the, talk over uh cameras like this easily and even even back when dial up was there this it's jumped a million times uh, the other way it's just not i don't know i don't know what the future is uh, that's what's confusing to me yeah but i want us writing it not our grandparents <laughs> you know? i want them writing the laws and the thing too is if your friend could make it in even though he's going to be outnumbered by the grandparents because a lot of them are going to win over 90 percent of the people that are already in con Congress get their jobs back because they've rigged the the maps. Mm -hmm. But even if we can just get a few of us in and they can stand on the floor of the House of Representatives and just call shenanigans and just point out what's happening on C-SPAN, I mean, that would make such a huge difference to have an articulate person there to say, this is what's happening. This is not cool. Let me put it in terms that you're going to understand. This is what's in this bill. I mean, I have daydreams about doing this because I think it would be so much fun. I wish comedians would do it. And this isn't even a joke. I, if you look at what C-SPAN is, it is TV spots every single day that are international. And if we could just get some insightful people in there just to point out what is going on, it would make a huge difference. So I don't even think we necessarily have to overturn the entire Congress in 2018 because that's a tall order. But just get a few younger, better people in there to make the arguments that you and I are making. I think it'll make a big difference because these people have to be told to their faces. And no one's doing it right now. Well, you They're you in had, a weird bubble. Very weird. Super weird bubble. Are you kidding me? It's a, it, D.C., it's just a weird place to of power moves and lobbyists. I, I can't even imagine what it's like living there. But you had Al Franken. He was a, was he, I don't know if he did stand-up, but he was a comedic actor. Wasn't he? Yeah, he did stand up and he was a writer for SNL. He was on SNL for a long time. And he started um, then he started hugging girls way too tight and grabbing them in pictures. <laughs> that picture, that poor guy. It's awful. Is he uh is I he, mean the poor uh, girl too, but Jesus, he couldn't that picture was pretty bad. I mean, that that just shows a I mean just a lapse in judgment, really. He wasn't like he was he wasn't nineteen years old in that picture. He wasn't, but at the same time he was a comedian. He also wasn't a senator. You know, yeah. it was he was going to these different things, not as a stump speech. He was going to make people laugh, you know, and I feel like if he had been friends with that girl, like I can absolutely see one of my guy friends. If I pass out make, t taking the same exact picture and I would laugh at it. It's all about how their relationship was, you know, like. I don't know. I just I think it's different when you're a comedian versus being a senator on a comedy tour. Yeah. It's just I can see that gray area, I guess. Yeah, well, it sounded like he she felt creeped out by him trying to Absolutely. kiss her when they were he wanted to practice their skit like five times and there was a he wanted yeah. to kiss her every time and something to try to he stick was his gross tongue. they were yeah. not friends like i get it yeah like, yeah if it was were... a different situation they were not besties exactly so you can't yeah you can't do that unless you're super close i guess but jen really appreciate you coming on where would you want to send people that want to consume all the great content you're putting out well, the podcast is called Congressional Dish, and you can find that anywhere podcasts are found, including Spotify and iHeartRadio now. And um, there's also congressionaldish.com because I think it's important just to point out that I'm just a person <laughs> doing this from my bedroom. So the show notes are really important. That's where I put all of my sources. And when I read a bill, I link to the individual provisions so you can see what I'm talking about because I don't expect anyone to just trust me. So congressionaldish.com, and you can subscribe 
from there. But yeah, thank you so much for having me, AJ. This was really fun. Awesome. Thank you very much. And I know what I think is cool. You you don't take uh, sponsors on your show, and you it's all through Patreon and, and donations. And I guess because you don't want to have to to kowtow to Verizon when you say something. <laughs> exactly. No, I've been very very. Um, guarded in the partnerships that I make. I have none. I won't join networks. Um, I won't take any sponsors. I'm keeping this as independent as possible. In fact, I don't even, I don't put my stuff on YouTube. I just, it's as independent as it can possibly be. So my listeners do fund it and it's awesome. Well, so. Great. We, we will uh, we'll look forward to, to checking out your stuff and, and hopefully I'll have you on here down the line. And I, I definitely learned a lot today. I think our listeners did as well. So thanks a lot, Jen. Awesome. Thank you. And I'd, I'd do this anytime. Thank All you right. very much. Thanks. We're glad you could join us for today's conversation. After you subscribe to the show, head over to thehawkcast.com or reach out to AJ directly on Twitter at official AJ Hawk to recommend future guests that will help us inspire people to keep talking. Thanks again. And we look forward to speaking with you next time on the Hawkcast.